Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, I'm Matt Levitt. Uh, I am the Fromer Wexler Fellow and the Director of the Reinhard Program on Counterterrorism and Intelligence. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today for a conversation about the Islamic State in Syria. Uh, what's next? Um, it's uh, timely, given that uh, the Islamic State has just announced the uh, Kunyas, anyway, if not the actual names of the new spokespersons and uh, and leaders of the Islamic State, we'll we'll take bets later on whether this this uh, new Abu Hamza al Muhajir is in fact Haji Abdullah. I say yes. We'll see what you say later. Um, we are uh, very very pleased to have with us uh, our own uh, Aaron Zellin, uh, uh, Devor Margolin from uh, the program on extremism uh, at Georgetown, and Amar. Pardon? George Washington. What did I say? Georgetown. I teach at Georgetown, so that's a, sorry, George Washington University, and Amar uh, Amarak Singham from uh, uh, Toronto, who's up on the screen. Hey, Amar, how are you? There he is. Um, so, uh, Aaron is the Richard Barrow Fellow here, and is uh, in the Counterterrorism Program, and is the author, uh, most recently, of a uh, study on. Oh, there you go. Waliyat al-Hal, Remaining and Incubating the Next Islamic State Generation. Uh, he's also the author of the forthcoming book, Your Sons at Your Service, Tunisia's Missionaries of Jihad, to be published by Columbia University Press. It makes for a wonderful uh, Christmas and Hanukkah present, so get on your phones and order it now. Uh, Devar is a senior research fellow at, uh, at the program on extremism at George Washington University and is the author uh, of... Uh, most recently through POE, uh, a study entitled Changing Role of Women in Violent Islamist Groups from Hamas to the Islamic State. And Amar is an assistant professor in the School of Religion at Queen's University in Ontario. He's a senior research fellow at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue and an associate fellow at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization uh, in London. Uh, most relevant to today's conversation, he recently returned from a week in northeast Syria, including a visit to the Al-Hal camp and uh, Raqqa, the former uh, so-called Islamic State uh, capital. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, I'll turn it over uh, to you, Aaron, and then we'll go to Devorah and then to Amar, and then we'll open it up uh, for Q&A. All right, thanks for the introduction, Matt, and I'm happy to have Devorah and Amar here as well. Um, so it's been a busy few weeks, huh? Uh, a few things have happened. Um, there's a lot to cover, of course, so um, I just wanted to briefly discuss what the Islamic State's been doing in Syria since it last controlled territory, uh, which is in late March earlier this year, um, as well as some issues related to the Al-Hol camp um, that I discussed in this paper, which has a lot more details than I'm gonna get into today. Um, and uh, uh, Devor and Amar will discuss some of these things as well. Um, we're going to try and be brief since I'm sure there are a lot of questions and discussions we might not have because there's been so many changing dynamics over the last few weeks. Um, but as Matt alluded to, we do have some breaking news just within the last hour. Uh, the Islamic State put out uh, an audio message from its uh, new spokesperson, Abu Hamza al Quraishi. Um, noting that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is in fact dead, as well as the former spokesperson Abu Hamza al-Muhajir. Um, in this uh, audio, they also confirm that the former spokesperson is of Saudi descent. Um, uh, it seems, according to uh, the release as well, that the new spokesperson is also a foreigner, um, but both individuals, um, the new spokesperson and the new caliph, who's going by the name Abu Ibrahim al-Hashimi al-Qureshi, um, we don't know who their actual identities are as of yet. Uh, though, uh, based off of some rumors and some thoughts by people that focus on this stuff in the weeds, it's quite possible that the new uh, you know, uh, self-declared caliph is a guy named Haji Abdullah, um, because previously he was Baghdadi's deputy, um, and he also comes from the Quraysh lineage, according to various rumors that have been heard. But I'm sure we'll get some more information in the coming days, weeks, months, whoever knows. Because one of the interesting things with the Islamic State is that there was not actual 100% confirmation who Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was until he actually went up the stairs of the minbar in Mosul in July 2014 when he agreed to become the caliph in the first place. Because the first four years of his rule, he didn't actually show his face. So you know, we might never have 100% confirmation in the near term, at least. Um, 
What I expect to see now in relation to this is that we'll probably get a series of bayat or pledges, religious uh, pledges of allegiance to this new caliph um, from the supporters online. And we've already seen some of this where some of them are saying things like, quote, we declare bayat to the caliph Sheikh Abu Ibrahim al-Hashmi al-Qureshi, um, pledging to listen and obey in times of delight and dislike and in times of hardship and ease and to not dispute the manner of those in authority. So I expect we'll be seeing these types of things from supporters, um, but also as part of rolling this out, I imagine based off of what we know about the Islamic State's messaging and propaganda style that we'll see a series of video messages coming out from their various branches all over the world, um, or as they call them provinces, wilayat. So uh, that's something I'm looking to now in the coming weeks and months or so. Um, so that's just sort of the main thing off the top um, based off of what just happened in the last hour or so. In terms of uh, the Islamic State in Syria in particular since the fall of their territorial control, um, one of the things to remember about this group is that um, they've been here before. This isn't likely to cause much disruption in their day-to-day -day operations. Part of this is the fact that uh, they had people lined up in place likely to take on the role of caliph and spokesperson, um, which is why it happened so quickly. Um, it's also important to remember that they were able to survive their loss of uh, territory or some level of strength during the U.S. surge of troops as well as the tribal awakening in Iraq last decade from around 2007 to 2009. Um, and, uh, you know, Washington and its allies eventually learned that such tactical victories could be misleading. Um, uh, since when the last American troops left Iraq in December 2011, few imagined that they would be uh, back so quickly within three years after um, the Islamic State reemerged and took over territory, not just in Iraq this time, but also in Syria um, as well. And one of the things to note is that this experience of them sort of being in the wilderness um, quote unquote, uh, provided them some lessons on how to adapt and do what they're doing now in retreat from their loss of territory currently. Um, as a result, you started to see the group actually all the way back in May 2016, almost three years prior to them losing their last sliver of territory, telling their supporters that, look, we're probably going to lose territory, but this is not the end of anything. So. Uh, just to highlight this uh, from a speech from Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, who had been the group's spokesperson previously, um, who was killed a few years ago as well, um, he noted, quote, Victory is the defeat of one's opponent. Were we defeated when we lost the cities in Iraq and were, were in the desert without any city or land? And would we be defeated if we lost Mosul, Sirte, or Raqqa? All three of them were key capitals of the Islamic State in Iraq, Syria, and Libya before they lost them. And then he goes on to say, certainly not, true defeat is the loss of willpower and desire to fight, fight, end quote. So I think this is important to understand in the context of this group and their mentality. They don't see the loss of territory as a loss for themselves. They just see it as a test from God. And one of the things to, to highlight after they did lose their last sliver of territory in late March this year um, was when the recently killed spokesperson Abu Hassan al-Muhajir declared, by God's grace, the sons of the caliphate continue to prove that they are the firm and solid rock in which they'll break the alliance of the infidels. They will retreat in disgrace and shame. And for many of them, after uh, President Trump's announcement that the U.S. was withdrawing troops from Syria a week or two ago, they saw this as some type of prediction in that things were on their side and that they're following God's path. And as long as they did that, then everything would work out for them. And part of this is that uh, they saw this as a test from God. And he continued later in the message saying, quote, victory comes with patience, comfort comes with suffering, with patience comes certainty in the promise. And that those that were seen as hypocrites then and defecting or uh, not being a part of the Islamic State anymore would be shown as hypocrites and therefore they would no longer be part of the movement. And this would strengthen their resolve. So just as context for what the Islamic State has been doing in Syria since uh, the end of March, uh, they've claimed over 600 attacks in various provinces um, that they claim to control, even though they don't control any territory now. 330 of them were in Deir Ezzor province, uh, 103 in Hasaka province, 99 in Raqqa province, 33 in Homs, uh, 10 in Dara, 9 in Aleppo, and 3 in Damascus. Um, so it illustrates that much of their operations are still in the eastern part of Syria at this juncture. 
The biggest question going forward, um, which both Devor and Amar will discuss as well, is related to the question and status of those who are in prison and now in IDP camps as well after ISIS lost territory. Um, amongst the most relevant is the Al-Hol camp, which as I note, I did go into in this report. Um, uh, while it discusses humanitarian conditions and some of the demographics, right here I'm going to talk more about some of the security-related issues, especially those amongst the true believers in the camp. Um, uh, just so as context, the camp has around 68,000 people in it right now. Um, it's split up into two sections. One is just Iraqis and Syrians who are the bulk of the population. And it's important to note that amongst this population are those that were coerced into joining or being married into the Islamic State. So not all of these people are actually Islamic State members or supporters. There are also Yazidi women who are enslaved by the Islamic State in this camp as well. Why they're being put in the same camp as some ISIS supporters, I don't know, but they are there. So it's important to note when people say, oh, there's 68,000 people in this camp. Not all of them are ISIS. Um, uh, then within the other half of the camp is this Foreigners Act Annex, which is a mu much smaller. There's about 11,000 of the 68,000 people there. And within the Foreigners Act a Annex, there's this uh, subsection called Jebel al baruz which is a reference to the last territory that ISIS was controlling in Syria, the town of Baruz. Um, and this is where sort of the most extreme elements of the true believers still reside. And they've sought to preserve the group's territorial aspirations from within the camp, um, as well as their brutal methods of governance. So as we've seen with ISIS's female institutions in the past, the Al-Khansa Brigade, um, these women act primarily as sort of a hizba force within the camp or moral policing. And we've seen them running secret courts as well in this camp as well. Um, and as a result of this vigilantism, there have been uh, dozens of women and children who have been killed by this group of people within the camp. Um, and this doesn't even include sort of the riots and the attacks they've conducted against um, the SDF internal forces within the camp as well. At the same time, we're also seeing them educating some of the children and orphans in the camp, hoping to sort of produce the next generation of jihadis um, to continue their multi-generational project that ISIS is trying to do. Um, what makes this issue so pressing, though, is the fact that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, before his death in mid-September, actually put out a statement telling people that they should break people out of the IDP camps, not just the whole, but others such as Ain Issa, as well as those males that are imprisoned in actual prisons. Um, and we've already seen uh, some of uh, the outcomes of this, in part because of the Turkish incursion into Syria, which has created some deterioration in the security, um, which has led to 700 foreign women and children leaving the Ain Issa camp. Um, and some of them have even joined back up with ISIS. Others, according to reports from Al-Qaeda channels, at least online, have fled to Idlib province and been secured by them as well. Um, but for now, there's not a lot known specifically about every single person that left the camp then. And, and uh, so, but one of the things going forward that I'd look to is to see how much the group will continue to sort of test the security architecture, whether it's the whole camp, whether it's the Ionisa camp, whether it's the prisons, because as we've seen um, in the past with the Islamic State, when they were building themselves back up in Iraq earlier in the decade, um, that they had their breaking of the walls campaign from July 2012 to July 2013, which led to the uh, breaking out of a number of prisoners, which helped replenish um, uh, the number of fighters they had in their forces. Of course, this would be different, not only just fighters if they release people from prison, but also these women and children, which would help out with their broader administrative and governance aspect of their project. Um, I'll leave it at that, since I know Devora and Amar will get into some more specifics, um, but I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions since is a uh, changing reality going on right now. Thank you. Thank you so much to Matt and Aaron for having me and to the Washington Institute. And hi, Amar. Um, so I just want to begin by discussing a bit about Baghdadi and his death. Um, we got so carried up in the events in the last hour, Aaron and I have been talking uh, extensively about this, but also to go back to why the death of Baghdadi is significant. It is obviously not the end of the organization, but it shows that the organization is more than just one man, um, and that the ideology will continue, and people will continue to support this group despite the death of Baghdadi. Um, what will be interesting is that um, 
the announcement that we just heard of the new leader, the new caliph, uh, was very much hearkening back to the perfect trifecta of who Baghdadi was. He wasn't just a military commander. He wasn't just a religious leader. He wasn't just from the same tribe of the Prophet Muhammad. He was all three of these things, which made him the perfect person to be the leader of such a group that was trying to create not just the territorial uh, claim, but really the religious uh, justification for their actions. Um, and it's extremely interesting that they were able to find a leader that at least according to them, hit all three of these perfect trifecta of the, the perfect next leader. Um, a little bit more about that seven and a half minute speech that we heard. Um, it's very important to note that he, according to the speech, was selected by a shura council, which means, again, we're talking about a committee that was probably in place beforehand. And what this does is it shows the bureaucracy of the organization. Um, there was a lot of talk about uh, the loss of territory. Was this bureaucracy still in place? We know that the Islamic State was one of the biggest and most successful bureaucratic groups, uh, other than my dear favorite Hezbollah, um, that was able to operate. Um, and so they were collecting taxes, they were offering birth certificates, but they're really a bureaucratic organization. And despite its leadership decapitation, by announcing that it was chosen, this new leader was chosen by a Shura Council, it's showing that bureaucracy is still in place. Um, when we talk about the death of Baghdadi, I just kind of want to quickly touch on two very interesting points. Um, the first was where he was killed in Idlib, um, which is not an ISIS stronghold, but rather it's in a mixed area, including different Al Qaeda affiliates. Um, and reports state that he was living pretty freely and mixing with other groups. Um, this is not necessarily at the ideological level, but really at the tactical level. Um, my colleague Assad al-Muhammad has touched on this a bit and has another article forthcoming. But what does this mean when Islamic State is talking on a tactical level to groups that it ideologically is in competition with? The second thing that's very interesting is that he killed himself and three children using a suicide vest. His two wives that were also killed by the U.S. forces were also wearing but had not yet detonated their suicide vests. Suicide is not permitted in Islam. However, the jihadi movement has always allowed for some sort of fatwa or justification for these actions in very specific situations. For those of you who are not um, very intricate with the uh, justifications, the number one justification used actually to talk about the permissibility of suicide bombing is from a Saudi cleric named Yusuf Alari. And what he did was he actually was talking about a female suicide bomber in Chechnya who carried out an attack. And it came known as the permissibility of suicide bombing, this fatwa. And in fact, it's kind of ignored that it was in justification for a woman carrying out this attack, and it's used against every individual, men and women who carry out these justifications. It's used as a justification for all men and women who carry out such attacks. Um, for myself, who's extremely interested in the permissibility of women's involvement in acts of violence, this is really significant, actually, that the number one fatwa used as a justification for suicide terrorism is for a woman. As Aaron touched on before, the caliphate itself, the physical caliphate, was active from June 2014 to March 2019. That's five years of governance until ISIS finally lost control. ISIS broadcast its brutality, its state building, and across multiple languages and across lots of propaganda, uh, visual, audio, and written. It brought back slavery and it sanctioned rape. But most of all, ISIS governed both public and private life. It was a bureaucracy and expanded its ideology and its idea of its province and governance across other areas, including Afghanistan, Libya, Nigeria, Yemen, and the Philippines. Even after the fall of Baghouz, ISIS still managed to carry out several major terrorist attacks, including in Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, and Iraq. My personal focus on this and what I'll be talking about today is women. So how did ISIS promise women to come and join this state building project in Iraq, specifically talking about foreign women? It used its propaganda to promise women to be part of something, to be wives, mothers, and educators of the next generation, to be jihadi torchbearers, to be a safe place for women, and to be part of a sisterhood. Interesting enough, they also did not include imagery of women. Uh, one part of my PhD was looking at how many images of women could I find in their English language propaganda. There's four. They're all young girls, and all of them are covered modestly. There are no images in their magazines of women. Uh, as we get further along uh, in 2017, we saw that they began to change the propaganda a bit. So early propaganda really focused on the state building. In 2015, as they began to be targeted by international forces, they began to kind of acknowledge this idea that perhaps territory would be lost. And this changed their interaction with what women's roles should be in the group, too. 
So they began to say, if you're attacked, you can then respond. By 2017, they realized that major territorial losses had occurred. And in fact, they said women should pick up arms. And a very infamous video called Inside the Caliphate 7, uh, we are presumed to believe that these individuals are women, covered from head to toe, were picking up arms and fighting alongside men. But propaganda is different than reality. We understand that women's involvement in the Islamic State were both as victims and perpetrators. They were sexual slaves, victims of sexual assault. They were unable to move without male escorts. They were subjugated to men. But women were also perpetrators. As Aaron mentioned, they were part of the Kinsah Brigade, an all-female religious Hizba unit, and they acted as recruiters and propagandists. And in fact, by the time of the Battle of Baguz in March of 2019, we know that a number of them picked up arms because they filmed themselves and broadcasted it for us to see. But what we need to do is we need to disaggregate women and children. Life for children are purely as victims in the Islamic State. While adults had agency for going to join the group, children did not. Children are victims. They, list, they lived very horrible lives under the Islamic State, witnessed extreme violence, and in some cases were forced to carry out acts of violence. For example, the Cubs of the Caliphate. We know that about 42,000 people uh, from all over the world went to Syria and Iraq. About 75% of them were men. And of that, about only 7,000 are recorded to have returned. And this is great research by Joanna Cook and Gina Vale. The FBI estimates that here in the United States, about 300 individuals have gone over. We at the program on extremism have identified 82 of those individuals by name, 15 of whom are women. And we've also identified 17 of whom have returned. 12 of them are men, five of them are women. And that's not including children because children are not listed. Europe, on the other hand, has much higher numbers and has mostly shirked the responsibility when it comes to repatriation. For example, of the 900 people that have traveled from the UK, approximately 400 have returned and only 40 have been prosecuted as of February 2019. The UK, along with many other countries, rather than dealing with these individuals, has revoked citizenship, most famously of Shamima Begum and Jack Letts. But on this scale, nobody compares to countries like Russia that has thousands of individuals who have went over. Russia has also been very clear that they do not plan on repatriating these individuals. And this is an issue that we will have to continue to discuss as we move forward. Since the decline of the Islamic State and really the fall of Baguz, the US and many other countries around the world have relied heavily on the Syrian Democratic Forces, a Kurdish group, to administer the IDP camps and prisons. And this is not a sustainable solution. With the withdrawal, the U.S. withdrawal from Syria, there's been an abandonment of our Kurdish allies who have done bulk of the work running the IDP camps. While we stay with the oil fields and we are ignoring the Syrian democratic forces, we're saying that human life is not a priority for the U.S. As Aaron mentioned before, the current threat, the breakouts of the detention centers in Kamshili, 800 women fleeing minors, women and minors who are fleeing from an Isa camp, as well as the escape of almost 100 Islamic State prisoners, coupled with Baghdadi's last speech talking about breaking these women free, shows that this is a real and unsustainable threat. But what we need to do is we need to make sure that this is not just a humanitarian, moral, and security issue that we need to address, but that we need to not paint both women and children with the same paintbrush, and we need to not paint all women the same way. Women and children need to be disaggregated. Children are purely victims in this, and we need to make sure that they are addressed as such. We also need to make sure that not all women have the same, uh, each woman needs to be identified in a case-by-case -case basis. This is because some women did have agency in deciding to go and join the group, but others were coerced. We know of numerous cases of children who were stolen from parents and told, if you don't follow us, you will never see your child again. Some could argue that this is still an agency to join, but we need to understand this coercion was part of some of the women who traveled. Should the camps fall, 55% of the children in all whole are under the age of 12. They could go into a place that has no safety net. They could be taken and forced to become child soldiers for ISIS or other groups. They could be seen as ISIS members by local and face retribution and reprisal attacks. They could also fall to the Assad regime and become victims of both the prisons and torture that take place there. There's not just a moral and humanitarian, but also a security issue to maintain. We don't want to do what the Iraqis have done. Iraq has had 10-minute trials. In 2018 alone, 466 women and 108 minors have either been sentenced to life in prison or death. We need to make sure that adults are given fair, tri fair trials for the crimes they have committed, and then imprisoned, rehabilitated, and reintegrated as appropriate. 
Children are the responsibility of their home countries, which need to address this future welfare and rehabilitation. We have a robust social, judicial, and penal system in place, specifically here in the United States, and we're highly capable of managing these populations. Current events show that we must address this before it's too late. Thank you. Excellent. Amar, the, uh, the floor, the, the video is yours. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much. Um, sorry I couldn't be there in person, but it's Halloween and I have to take my daughter trick or treating, and I don't want to face that kind of wrath um, if I'm not if I'm not there. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly um, so that I can show you some slides. Um, everybody see the slides? No, oh, not yet. I said you start sharing. No. Uh, hold on, I'm not sure. There, oh, it okay. popped up and went away. Interesting. How about now? Just you. Well, not just. Just me again. <laughs> yeah. You can see the slides now. It says, uh, can we make them bigger? Small. It says you're sharing your screen. It's very tiny. The uh, slide is tiny. It's not full screen. Okay. Let me. I don't really know how to. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, th uh, thanks again. Um, I'll just kind of go over uh, some of the projects that we've been involved with in, in terms of uh, inter interviews, in interviews with foreign fighters, um, <clears throat> and, and particularly on the returning issue. Some of it's been covered already by uh, Aaron and Deborah, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a bit of uh, context about what's happening uh, on the ground in a bit more detail uh, as well. Um, so for the last six years or so, uh, we've been involved with the project mainly uh, looking to try to interview as many foreign fighters as possible over Skype, Telegram, Kick Messenger, uh, and, and so on. Uh, as many of you know, um, a lot of Western foreign fighters and non-Western foreign fighters, for that matter, uh, travel to places like Syria and Iraq and uh, basically maintain their social media profiles. And, and uh, it created this kind of interesting opportunity for researchers to actually um, reach out and talk to them just like you would reach out and talk to anybody else. Um, and so uh, that, that, that's kind of what we started to do. Um, and as they moved into places like Telegram as well, um, uh, we built uh, archivers and scrapers to kind of monitor in a more systematic way um, what was happening on the in, in, um, in Telegram as well. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I mean, I think, I think it's sometimes important to uh, think about how quickly uh, this kind of world's most feared terrorist organization lost all of its territory, right? I mean, we're talking March 31st, 2017. Uh, it was in control of a, a, a solid chunk of Mosul. A couple months later, uh, Mosul was gone. Uh, same thing with Raqqa in May 2017. Uh, it controlled quite a bit of the city of – it controlled all of the city of Raqqa and quite a bit of the uh, countryside. <clears throat> And again, a couple months later, uh, it was gone. Uh, and, 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 and as a lot of these fighters then moved into Deir Azor, uh, and particularly in, uh, in, a, in a small village called Baguz that, that was been mentioned already, uh, February 2019, they still controlled kind of a sliver, sliver of territory. Um, the, a month and a half later, uh, all of the territory was basically gone. Um, and at, at, at the moment, it's basically um, uh, several or, or several small patches of territory in uh, Iraq and Syria that, uh, you know, ma maintain some kind of sleeper cell activity uh, that we can see. The administrative um, apparatus that kind of existed in some of these cities is long gone, uh, and, and just how quickly it kind of all disappeared. What happened when Baguz fell uh, is that anyone who came out of that territory, um, men and women and children, uh, were fingerprinted uh, and, and, and separated for the most part. Men were taken to prisons, uh, a variety of prisons that dot uh, northeastern Syria. Uh, the women were taken to a set of three camps. Uh, one of them uh, is, is uh, Al Roj camp, which I visited last year. Um, and it, it's, it's a, quite a tiny camp, quite a manageable camp. There's only about 1,700 individuals there uh, to this day. Um, it's actually a much older camp, so it contained uh, a lot of refugees that were uh, also fleeing uh, from ISIS territory and other um, 
and other bombardments uh, that, 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 that kind of took up home in this camp um, and that they kind of make up the vast majority <coughs> of the camp even to this day. And so it, there's a much more kind of solid um, kind of, I don't know, uh, uh, solid environment in which kind of ISIS, hardcore ISIS doesn't really take hold uh, as you'll see in a, in a moment. Um, what's happening with Al Roach camp at the moment is that in a whole camp, which is the second major camp, um, a lot of Western women who are being threatened, uh, threatened in this camp, and threatened in Al Hol are actually being moved uh, to Roj, right? And so one of the one of the ones that was moved very re very recently is actually Shamima Begum, who I think, um, after giving several media interviews, uh, began to receive uh, threats from her fellow uh, campmates, and and the, the Kurdish authorities moved her to Al Roj. Um, and so uh, Al Roj has become a kind of safe haven in, in many ways for some Western women who've become threatened uh, for some of their activities uh, in Al Hol. Um, Al Hol camp uh, is entirely different, uh, as it's kind of been touched on. Um, you know, we're comparing 1,700 people in Al Roj to 68,000 people in Al Hol uh, as of this September uh, from over 60 countries, and about 55% of them uh, are under the age of 12. So when you visit the camp, um, the first thing that strikes you is the kind of sea of children, right? It, it, it's kind of remarkable to see. You, 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 you um, often don't realize from uh, media coverage of it as a kind of ISIS camp and so on, um, uh, you know, quote unquote ISIS camp, but you walk in and it's just a sea of children. Um, and, <clears throat> and, and the kind of uh, foreigners are held right near the entrance of the camp in what's known as the Foreigner Annex. Um, and uh, they have very little contact, very little awareness of what's happening in the rest of the camp, in the Syrian and Iraqi uh, sections of the camp. Um, and this annex has kind of been the center of all the media attention that we've seen uh, so far, right? Um, uh, which I'll get to in a second. But the other thing to keep in mind um, is that even though there are kind of prisoners or from 60 different countries, only about 18 countries from uh, by my probably a bit out of date at the moment, uh, have actually done anything to repatriate their citizens in any meaningful way. And, and even that approach has been quite scattered. And so uh, some people have just taken one or two men, others have taken just one or two women, um, others have just taken the orphans and left the women and uh, families, uh, the women and men behind. Um, and so it, uh, even from the 18 countries that we know of, there hasn't really been a systematic approach to kind of repatriate their citizens. It's been a haphazard and scattered um, approach the whole time. Um, so there, there isn't really one country that's um, taking taking an approach that we can kind of try to replicate. Um, and that that's kind of for a variety of reasons, which uh, if we have time, all we can get into. Um, Al Hol um, is, is basically what the only way you can describe it is a kind of emergency humanitarian situation, right? I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to. There's no real way to overemphasize this. There are waterborne respiratory diseases, acute malnutrition for all the children. Um, several instances of uh, and, and women in the camp have texted me uh, these kinds of stories of acute diarrhea of all of their uh, of, of some of their children. At least 300 children have died just in 2019 alone. Um, only about three field hospitals are operative for the entire uh, 68,000 people, um, and, and uh, Medicine Sans Frontières uh, or Doctors Without Borders goes in uh, quite, a, uh, uh, quite often, but that's also changed in the last little while since Trump um, pulled out troops or has threatened to pull out troops. Um, <clears throat> and, and what complicates matters in Al Hol is that about 10,000 um, residents of, of the camp are actually older refugees who are uh, very much fleeing ISIS control and, and, and uh, fled ISIS control of their neighborhoods and villages. And so now they're, uh, as kind of Aaron touched on, uh, they're being held in the same camp as uh, a, a lot of these uh, more hardcore types that, have came out, that came out of the village of Bagus. And, um, and so there have been a lot of attacks on refugees by the kind of hardcore women uh, who fashioned uh, weapons and so on and have, have actually attacked a few refugees um, and have actually also attacked the guards. Um, quite heavily as well, because 68,000 people are being guarded by about 300 SDF guards, uh, massively outnumbered already, uh, and, and, and the resources just aren't there to kind of uh, maintain peace in any meaningful way. Uh, people, there's lots of rumors of people being smog smuggled out, uh, paying guards uh, to smuggle them out of the out of the area into Idlib, or uh, some trying to make it to Turkey. Um, NGOs are bringing in uh, food kits. Uh, the United Nations is bringing in food kits, uh, sometimes with uh, knives and forks, um, and which are being obviously repurposed uh, as weapons. Several SDF guards have been stabbed in the back uh, by women with fairly large blades. I'm not entirely sure. 
where where these blades are coming from. But uh, even when we visited the the camp, um, there was this little four year old basically with this massive blade um, that just was just sitting there cutting up uh, a plastic water bottle, right? And and he was just very busy cutting up a water bottle for 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 half an hour. Um, and but it, w it wasn't entirely clear where or how he was able to get his hands on this massive massive blade. The other challenge, of course, is that a lot of these children are being taught uh, by their mothers that um, the SDF guards that are guarding them are the, basically the same ones that kill their father and put them in this situation. And so the the children themselves, when they see SDF guards, are throwing stones at them, or spitting at them, uh, or throwing feces at them. Um, and so it's just become a a, a remarkably difficult situation for uh, everyone concerned. We were there on the 30th of September, which uh, we went to kind of interview some of the women and uh, family members that were there, uh, and it, it uh, immediately kind of became a, a crazy situation. The moment we landed there, there was rumors that um, several of the women, some of the more hardcore Hizbah or morality police uh, cohort of the camp were uh, holding this kind of makeshift uh, uh, court where uh, uh, one or two women have been had been kind of set aside for punishment for whatever crime that they committed, whether it was dressing wrong or acting wrong or saying the wrong thing or criticizing ISIS. Um, and there was a there's supposed to be punishment kind of um, given to these women. The SDF had somehow heard about this or found out about this and tried to interrupt the meeting, uh, arrested about 15 of the women. Um, the others that were in the area uh, became immediately pissed off at this arrest and started charging uh, the SDF guards who started to fire into the air uh, and started to fire uh, at the feet of, of some of these women who were walking towards them. Um, and again, I want to stress that this is a sea of children as well in this camp, and um, uh, there was kind of live gunfire uh, over the tents and, and, and uh, into the ground while all of this was happening, while all the children were just standing around. Um, and it's quite remarkable to me that no one was actually injured. What happened next was we were asked to leave. Uh, we were told that it was too dangerous, so we left. Um, and then some of these news reports started coming out of MSF teams treat women for women for gunshot wounds. Um, and, and so uh, we don't entirely know what happened after we left, but clearly the situation escalated and several women uh, were hit with live rounds and at least one or two of them, I think, uh, were killed. I asked several women in, whole, in, in the whole camp afterwards and they basically said that um, you know, the, 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 the gunfire was, yeah, they, they started shooting into the air and started shooting into the ground, but at the same time, um, several of these rounds also uh, hit some of these women um, because it's a highly uh, contest, congested area. Um, so what, have been, what has been the impact on the children in general? Um, this kind of taps into the repatriation debate uh, in, in important ways as well. One of the main things that some of these children are struggling with is, of course, interrupted education. Um, most of the parents that I've spoken with or most of the uh, people that I've spoken with did not actually send their kids to so-called ISIS schools, right? They just kept them at home while in ISIS territory. Um, and so most of these women, most of these children, sorry, from 2014 onwards, um, have been out of school, have not uh, received any kind of education. Um, a lot of these children are suffering from uh, the death of a parent, the death of a sibling, uh, being separated from their parents. Uh, and we know from kind of uh, literature in the medical field that this is uh, associated with kind of long-term impacts uh, on, psycho on, on their psychological well-being. Um, and of course, there's the early exposure to violence problem. Uh, these children grew up uh, looking at executions, uh, experiencing shellings and drone strikes, and sometimes even witnessing uh, public beheadings. Uh, and all of this has uh, important impacts on their life as well. Um, and then a kind of broader uh, experience of, of, of the refugee experience itself, uh, coming out of Bagus, coming out of Deir um, uh, with, with with all of the kind of malnutrition, uh, depression, and survivor's guilt that's associated with that, uh, and, and, and constant dislocation that these children have experienced. And so um, leaving uh, tens of thousands of children, uh, or continuing to leave tens of thousands of children in this kind of environment um, isn't uh, ideal and isn't a great thing to do. Um, and and uh, we've kind of tried to push uh, in Canada and elsewhere uh, to uh, a kind of important uh, argument for repatriating a lot of these children. And of course, it's fallen mostly on deaf ears, um, but we'll see uh, we'll see where it goes. Um, I don't think I'll get into too much of this, uh, except to point out um, 
that part of the part of the challenge of the repatriation issue has been uh, this debate about whether we can charge these people, whether we can charge the men, charge the women, um, and I'll and I'll be the first to say that it's it's going to be very difficult, right? There's uh, a lot of challenges to charging um, some of these returnees, particularly in uh, places like Canada and and, and Europe. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has, I think, a uh, nimble enough material support law to uh, probably charge as many people as they like, but um, in Canada and elsewhere, uh, this has been a kind of ongoing debate and ongoing challenge uh, in terms of uh, uh, charging people who've actually returned to the country. So I will leave it there, and I'm uh, happy to take your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Omar uh, and Vora and Aaron, all three of you, uh, for uh, really fabulous presentations. I'll take the moderator's prerogative to, to throw out a question for the three of you, and maybe you can answer it in, in reverse order. Uh, so, uh, Amar, Javora, uh, and then Aaron, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the, from the audience. Um, and uh, I'll keep a list of people as I see you. We have plenty of time. We'll get to everybody. Uh, so my question for you is this. Um, we, uh, we've talked about the Islamic State in Syria. Let, let's, let's address a little bit of the end of the uh, title of today's event. You know, so what's next? W what do we do next? Uh, November 14th here in Washington, uh, there's going to be a meeting, a uh, ministerial level meeting of the counter ISIL coalition, uh, de-ISIS, defeat ISIS coalition. Um, and this is going to be uh, the first time there's a meeting since the president announced his withdrawal and then some of the withdrawals undone uh, since the uh, death of uh, Baghdadi. So you have now an ISIS that is still a threat. Um, it's experienced territorial loss. It's experienced leadership loss. It perhaps is in a position to be on the cusp of resuscitation because of the um, conditions for uh, breeding extremism in particular uh, in a hall uh, uh, and elsewhere. Um, and of course now the uh, um, rift between uh, the U.S. and its SDF partners and the Turkish incursion have created a whole new uh, set of dynamics. So if you had the opportunity uh, to uh, give a uh, elevator pitch uh, to the uh, counter ISIL coalition uh, on the 14th in a couple of weeks, uh, you know, what would be your, your top two issues for practical recommendations of, of things we have to do? Um, Amar, I could probably guess what yours will be based on your presentation. Let's, let's start with you. Sure. Um, I, I guess two things. One, yeah, one, I would very much uh, push for the repatriation of uh, all the prisoners and all the uh, women and children that are in the camps and prisons. Um, I think, uh, particularly if, if the U.S. pulls out uh, and, and uh, people are moved uh, to the front lines uh, in their war with Turkey, I think uh, we're going to see more uncertainty um, and, and kind of uh, more potential for disastrous events like we saw in Camp Inisa, for example, where uh, several hundred people uh, uh, tried to escape and several uh, escaped and uh, the camp was then mysteriously uh, destroyed and, and several women from Inisa camp had then to, had, were then bused back to El Hol camp. Um, and, and like I said before, a lot of the women that were in some of these other camps were actually put there because they faced extensive threats uh, while they were in El Hol camp. Um, and so they're, now they're back uh, with the same women that were uh, threatening them to begin with. Um, so that's one. Uh, no, no, number two, I think um, it's very important um, and I don't know the state of this on the ground, particularly in Derazor, but um, to kind of make sure that, that the anti-sleeper cell raids um, are intact and continuing. Um, even when, when we were there, there were several raids going on. Uh, several people were getting arrested. Sleeper cells were being broken up. Um, and I think that's particularly important because what happened uh, in the few days after the announcement is that you had several car bombs go off in places like Kamishli and Raqqa. Um, and Kamishli, I should know, is a, is, is a safe Kurdish town. I mean, uh, it, it, with, with nice restaurants and, and uh, with relative stability. And we were kind of shocked to see um, several different car bombs go off in the city uh, very quickly after any hint of chaos and any hint of uncertainty. Um, so I think, um, as, as many of us know, uh, groups like ISIS kind of love the chaos and love the uncertainty, and they continue to thrive uh, in those environments. And so I have to, uh, one of the the, the arguments, I think, would be to make sure that the kind of uh, integrity of the raids and so on uh, are, are kept intact. Okay, Dvorah? I kind of cheated. Uh, I did a talk on Monday night at the 9-11 Museum with Graham Wood kind of addressing this. So 
I apologize for, for cheating. Um, but basically, ISIS has been beaten down before. This is not the first time that they've kind of, we've said, oh, they're, they're defeated, and then they've been able to come back. Um, and I think the number one thing is we don't want to underestimate them. Um, the announcement today shows that bureaucracy is still there and the call for bias and the call for the affiliates to continue to uh, show their support uh, will be very interesting. I'm sure as, as we speak, there has probably already been, uh, you know, some claims of the affiliation and the, the claims uh, to support the new caliph. Um, so I think we should not underestimate them. Um, I think on the very specific issues of prisoners in IDP camps, I think this is urgent. Uh, as Amar noted, the pullback of the Kurds uh, with the Turkish incursion means that the camps, which were already in a very precarious situation, are becoming more precarious. Um, in Isa, 800 women just disappeared from the camp. Um, they were kind of found in safe houses and picked back up and put back into Al Hol, but some of them weren't. Um, some we know disappeared and are never to be heard from again. Um, so there's not just the moral and humanitarian, but really the national security issue here. Um, the Islamic State views women as torchbearers, the educators of the next generation. They don't diminish women's roles. They don't necessarily see them as frontline fighters, but they don't diminish that role. That role as wife, mother, educator of the next generation is vital to the continuation of the organization. Baghdadi's speech, the last speech before he was killed, shows how important those women are to the future incarnations of the group. And we shouldn't underestimate that. Aaron? Uh, I think we all have similar themes and ideas, maybe slightly different angles on this. Um, I think one of the most important things in terms of sort of the kinetic aspect of this on a day-to-day -day level related to the sleeper cells already alluded to is sort of trying to build some trust back with the SDF. Um, I'm assuming that they don't fully trust the U.S. right now, and even though the U.S. says that they're now bringing some troops back in, um, they're probably having some alternative plans with the Assad regime, which is not good for anybody because anybody that knows anything about what the Assad regime has been doing over the last nine years is that they will be out for revenge against anybody if they do retake territories in northeast Syria, whether it's through some type of agreement with the Kurds or not. If you know the history of Syria, the Assad regime does not actually like the Kurds. Um, so that's something to think about too. And if Western countries actually do care about their citizens, whether they're worried about their uh, issues with being in courts or not, uh, don't be surprised if the Assad regime did get uh, control of these camps or prisons that either A, they'll execute people or they'll use it as some type of bargaining chip um, uh, against especially Western European countries. Um, so that's something to think about too. Uh, in terms of the camps themselves and this idea of repatriation, at least from my perspective, I think it's important um, that Western countries will then have more of a control over the situation if they actually bring their citizens back. They'll have some type of agency instead of things just rotting out there in the deserts uh, of northeast Syria. Um, they'll know who they are um, and what they're doing. Um, in addition to this, by bringing people back, you also make it harder for ISIS to replenish their forces, whether you're talking about the males in the prisons or the women and the children and orphans for their broader caliphate project. Um, uh, because if you bring them home, then if ISIS does break some people out, maybe it would just be people that are local, but it wouldn't be on such a grand scale. And they wouldn't be able to necessarily pick up from where they were before. So I think that that's something to think about as well in this regard. Can I just add one point? I think we're all kind of touching on it, but none of us have actually said the optics of the Assad regime taking control of citizens children even from the US, the UK, France, and what that could look like for the United States if you have to negotiate, you know, if the regime takes them back and threatens to execute children, what are we going to do? So we have uh, a lot to do with repatriation. Uh, we have an immediate problem in the camps. Uh, we have to continue the uh, this anti-sleeper uh, cell raids. Um, I will just say on the issue of repatriation and the ability to prosecute, um, Amar is right, we have a very broad material support statute in, in this country, and it may not be uh, enough to be able to uh, uh, successfully prosecute everybody simply because um, it's very difficult to collect actual evidence on the ground. Um, Aaron and I wrote about this uh, back in February, uh, so it's a very, very complicated situation. I actually think this is one of the things that 
the Counter ISIL Coalition might be uh, wise to consider is what types of laws or systems need to be put in place to address this very unique situation, um, especially for some of our partners that are not as capable as, say, Western European or, or American partners. Otherwise, it's very well, all well and good to say repatriate, but those countries are primarily concerned with not allowing terrorists back into their country. And if they don't think they're going to be able to put them away and put them away for a very long time, they're just not going to do it. I'd like to open up to uh, questions from the audience now. We'll start over here with Charles, and we'll make our way around. If you could wish, wait for the microphone and just introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Charles Depot. I'm a visiting fellow at the, the Institute. Um, following up on what you just said about the legal dimension, um, another option that has been discussed by Western uh, countries uh, um, and there was also the, the the topic of some discussion with the Iraqis, who was the setup of an ad hoc jurisdiction, uh, international jurisdiction, to prosecute uh, f not only foreign fighters but ISIS fighters in general, uh, knowing that uh, a large number of them are also Syrians and, and Iraqis. So I would be interested uh, to have your your, your views on uh, the, the speed and the practicality of uh, such a jurisdiction. Uh, another uh, idea I would just like to touch upon because I think it's very important to add on what has been said on the humanitarian situation. I think it's important to remind why this situation is so bad in these camps while from a purely technical point of view, the United Nations, the international community, has been dealing with an enormous flow of refugees and IDPs uh, for eight years in Syria. So why is the situation so dramatic when we look at the numbers uh, that you, the panelists mentioned? There are manageable numbers for international NGOs. And I think it's important to remind that uh, northeastern Syria has been uh, kind of isolated from the more general management of refugees and IDPs in Syria for a number of reasons. The first one being that um, many international donors refuse to put money in because they feared Turkish reaction uh, to operation uh, in SDF uh, territories. Another dimension was that some of the legal uh, options on the table, like using cross-border uh, um, shipment from Iraq, were actually not used by the UN because uh, it was opposed by uh, the Syrian regime. So, I mean, there is a number of very technical obstacles that made the work of the NGOs in these camps very difficult. The money was there somehow and is there, but they can actually not process it and provide support to, to, to the NGOs. So my final question about this would be for the panelists, how do you address uh, both the Assad dimension of this and the UN dimension uh, of the situation uh, now with the limited footprint of the US and the Turkish um, uh, operation uh, moving forward? Mar, you want to start with that one? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll start with the, I think you were talking about the international court, right? Um, uh, I, I, I think that, that question's an important one. It's been um, proposed by the Kurds themselves and Kurdish officials themselves as a likely option of having some kind of international court uh, in the region, which would uh, try ISIS fighters uh, mostly. Um, and and uh, then then the con then then after that, there's been kind of differing uh, ideas proposed. One, they will serve their sentence back in their home country, and and another one was that they would serve their sentence in Syria. Um, I think all of that is unlikely to happen, <laughs> um, partly because uh, m most of the time these kind of international courts are put forth through a UN mechanism, um, and then it, within the UN mechanism you have the problem of uh, the Russian veto, right? Um, and I think uh, you also have the problem of uh, who do you try? I think Assad would demand that even moderate rebels be uh, brought up on charges. I think the Turks would ask for the, for the Kurds to be brought up on charges, and I think the whole conversation will just kind of um, collapse pretty quickly. So I think that's the challenge of trying to build a kind of international uh, court system to deal with the issue. I don't, I don't, I don't see it as politically feasible. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I didn't entirely catch the refugee question, so I'll maybe let the panelists, other panelists, just uh, discuss that one. Just to jump in, I was uh, lucky enough to be on a panel on foreign fighters a month ago and have a representative from the Russian embassy come just to that panel to make a very clear statement that Russia will never allow that to happen. Um, that was the only panel they came to, the only statement that was made the whole conference. It was a four-day conference. 
uh, <laughs> and that was the only thing they wanted to be very clear. Russia will never allow that to happen. To which you said, thank you for your contribution. Okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Anything? Um, I mean, I think that says pretty much it, but you, I could also raise the issue of, you know, the justice in Iraq. I mean, they've been doing, like has been alluded to already, 10-minute trials, so that's not the rule of law. Then there's the issue of costs, and in the past, you know, how long these international trials of dragged out. I mean, there's still stuff related to Serbia and Bosnia going on. That's 25 years ago now. And then there's the issue of evidence again that you brought up. Um, and then where is this actually going to be housed, where the people will be imprisoned once that happened? Um, are we talking about some kind of like Guantanamo 2.0 without torture? Or is this going to be in a specific country? I don't know. But um, it just, if you look at it from a broader international perspective, politics perspective, it seems like there's a lot of complications once you start getting into the weeds of it than just the broader ideal of it. Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Mark Ginsburg. I want to throw a uh, rhetorical hand grenade into your laps. <laughs> uh, a couple of, a couple of months ago, a piece in CNN.com about the idea of establishing an island prison camp for these, for these people, other than the crocodile tears that we'll hear from a lot of folks about these poor ISIS fighters and their uh, supporters, the practicality of repatriating these people uh, is, to me, between zero and minus zero. And the fact is, is that the longer they are in Syria or Iraq, the more danger a national security problem this is for all concerned. Why, why aren't you all, or are any of you prepared to recognize uh, the fact that for several centuries, countries and international communities have dealt with this problem by, in effect, creating island prison camps and letting these people go where they belong, which is no longer a problem for society? I'm, I'll take that. Uh, <laughs> I think ignoring a problem now doesn't ignore the problem in the long run. I think if you look at US policy, Russian policy post Afghanistan in the 1970s, we kind of thought if we turned a blind eye and didn't do anything, then the ideology would kind of die and stay there, and it didn't. This isn't just about the individuals, uh, it's also about the ideology. Um, the ideology, as we know, is not just staying in Syria and Iraq. Um, as the numbers show, 55% of the individuals in Al Hol, which is the biggest camp holding 68,000 people, are children under the age of 12. So the first and foremost is disaggregating adults from children. Um, there are, in many countries, infrastructures in place to deal with child soldiers or children who have been victims of or experienced extensive violence. Um, I think that's like I said, not just a humanitarian and moral obligation, but a security obligation. This is a whole generation of kids that are U.S. citizens, U.K. citizens, French citizens who are going to grow up and be the next ISIS leaders. We haven't revoked their citizenship, all of them, yet. It's actually the numbers of people whose citizens have been revoked is very, very small. So in the U.S. Almost infinitesimal. Two. Right, two, two in the um, U.S. Well, and, and in the U.S., technically, there's one debate as to whether or not yeah. the one of them was Even revoked. Uh, it's highly controversial, um, and I don't think, personally, I, I just don't think it's a solution. At the end of the day, <clears throat> in the immediacy, I think the second part of Charles's question about trying to create a situation where, you know, the, the these camps sound, especially a whole, like it's huge, but in, in the context of dealing with refugee problems, it's, it's actually a manageable number. So... The real question to me is why the international community is allowing this to become a festering pool of extremism and we aren't sending in the proper numbers of properly armed people to desegregate at the true extremists from the children or from others and then we can have a better sense of how to deal with what will ultimately be not a tiny but a much smaller number than tens and tens of thousands of people and I don't think you're going to need an island for that. Uh, so uh, the technically, you know, whether it's a, an international court, whether it's done not through the UN, so Russia doesn't get a vote, um, what, how you do it in such a way if you involve Kurds it doesn't uh, make Turkey go through the roof, all of these are things that ultimately I think in a couple of weeks the uh, kind of ISIS coalition is going to have to start getting its hands dirty on exactly these types of things. Because um, in the real world I don't think you're going to get an international consensus on dumping a bunch of potentially bad people, and maybe some 
some people who uh, got mixed up in this but aren't actually militants themselves on an island somewhere and washing your hands of it. Yes, in the back. Let me let me just add, uh, if I can, yeah, very quickly please. to that question. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, part of the reason why there are a lot of ISIS fighters mixed in with non-ISIS fighters or uh, civilians in some of these camps is, is because uh, of donor countries and donor NGOs who refuse to provide any food and uh, uh, money and clothing and blankets to a camp full of 100% ISIS members, right? And so uh, the Kurds have had to mix up the population in order to kind of convince um, donor communities to actually fund uh, the, some, some of these camps. And so uh, the same problem exists if you drop them on an island somewhere. Uh, who's going to care for these people, right? <laughs> and um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're saying that you should just drop them on an island, let them all starve to death, um, I mean, that's another conversation, which I fundamentally disagree with, but that's another conversation. Um, but uh, that, that, that just kind of prolongs the same issue of who's going to actually feed these people, who's going who's gonna to pay to maintain an island of a terrorism island, um, and and, uh, and and so I don't think you get away from that question. Uh, that is paradise island. The other the other challenge, paradise island. <laughs> the other challenge, of course, is that none of these people have been charged, right? If we want to live by our ideals, um, even if even if, even if uh, someone like Jack Lutz, uh, who was arrested in 2017, has never been charged with anything, so he's been in prison now for two and a half years, uh, almost three years, uh, without charge, right? And so I think if, if we want to live by our ideals as, as kind of Western governments, um, we have to address that issue at, at, at some point, I think. In the back, uh, yeah. On that last point, I'm Ken Meyer, on that On that last point, it brought to mind the fact that uh, uh, there are people in Guantanamo who have still not been charged. So maybe the ideals in Canada are a little yeah. bit different than down here. Uh, Ms. Margolin, you mentioned that uh, Baghdadi's last speech was uh, uh, last speech before his timely de demise. Uh, when and where was that, and was it in person or by a medium? And Mr. Zellin, you mentioned that the Islamic State claimed some 600 attacks over some period of time in some area. How many attacks do we give them credit for? So Baghdadi releases most of his speech, 95% of his speeches, via uh, the spokesperson. Um, so this was released in September via the spokesperson. In sorry, in September via the spokesperson. So ninety five percent of the speeches. When's the last time that that has been taken public? Oh. That, that that would be the one. Yeah. There's been one. Just the, the July two thousand fourteen. The, the declaration of the Islamic State was the only. Two thousand fourteen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah, and until this, uh, there was a long period of time before he had appeared in a video uh, at all. Yeah, I mean, he was, was also March in a of this video uh, this April, uh, a couple of months ago, but it was in a private tent. It wasn't out in public. I mean, this is all for video. personal and operational security. It's totally understandable why it's been going on like this. Um, uh, in terms of their attacks, I mean, I, I, I think they're all pretty credible. Um, they usually have evidence of it, too, so I don't see why it wouldn't be true. The numbers are usually... Uh, extremely close to what official government um, tallies as well. Right up front, please. Hi, Camilla Schick from CBS News. I had a question uh, just to bring back to the new ISIS leader. It's mainly for Aaron. You mentioned Abdullah Kardash um, and that the, there's uh, chances that it's the same person that we're talking about here. Uh, but there's also been reporting that Abdullah Kardash's background is not of Sunni Arab descent, that he might be a Turkmen, for example. Is there, um, even though we haven't seen a visual of this person yet, uh, of the new leader, is there any chance that regardless of his descent that, that the group could say that he is of the Prophet Muhammad's tribal descent or not? Um, well, just to clarify, I mentioned Haji Abdullah uh, and Abdullah Kardash is Sorry, he's a. I think they're two different people. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, I don't think just for practicalities and the fact that their whole idea is based off of them having religious legitimacy that they would do something along those lines. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that there couldn't be somebody that's non-Arab, since there are some people that are of Kurdish or Turkmen descent that do claim through various intermarriages, you know, hundreds of years ago that go through sort of the. Hashemi Quraysh line as well. 
So to be to just from your perspective at the moment, do you think that that it's the same person who had had been? Uh, I don't know. I'm not in the group. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank I'm, you. I'm glad to I'm hear sure that. We'll find out soon enough. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I'll, I'll just I'll just throw out there that there's a little bit in the in the in the era of the post territorial defeat. There's, there, there's a real possibility for there to be, at least for a period of time, a distinction between the caliphate and the group. Uh, and so it's possible in the first instance that they just won't clarify and they'll just continue to call him Qureshi and, you know, you know, give you a private secret. You know, not everybody who claims to be a Qureshi is, in fact, Qureshi. Um, but uh, on top of that, I could see a situation where they would choose whoever would be the best person as an interim leader of the Islamic State group to lead the group. And then if there were an opportunity, then there, you could have a can caliph, caliph later. Um, they may not have the luxury. Yeah. Yeah, right here, please, Roy. It's coming on your right. Okay, thanks. Uh, it, I just find it <coughs> passing curious that uh, <coughs> the uh, coalition is going to have this meeting in a couple of weeks, and they will be discussing, among other things, <coughs> the prisoners. But this coalition goes back five years, and uh, prisoners certainly must go back several years, and they must have been collecting over a period of time. Uh, do you know, does anybody know the history of the discussions within the coalition about uh, what to do about prisoners? They, they, clearly it must have come up. In every war you always have prisoners and you, and you have to tend to them. I also find that the, <coughs> the fact that, the, that nobody's paying for their food <laughs> is shocking. Um, and uh, I mean, w w has the United States uh, just sort of all let this whole thing hang or does everybody else? Uh, I, I just find it so, so strange that, that only now it's being discussed. The U.S. is interesting, the fact that they have kind of taken their citizens and even taken control of other citizens out of the biggest camps and kind of taken them away. We don't really know where they are, but they haven't brought them back to our knowledge, but they have taken them out of the bigger camp. So a lot of journalists and, and academics have gone to these camps and looked for Americans and have not been able to find them because America's separated them um, on the U.S. case. But I, Mario, you want anything? Uh, no, I'll just underscore that because when I was there in October of last year, <clears throat> I asked to speak to several Americans and they said um, they are unavailable. <laughs> so, uh, they're, they're, they're currently, they were being held somewhere else uh, by the like Americans by. themselves. Yeah. It, it <laughs> seems to me that there's just been an abdication of responsibility of, from Western nations in general. They have just let people rot, essentially, whether in the prisons or in the camps, and that sort of like out of sight, out of mind type of thing. But as we know from the past with, you know, ISIS's predecessor group, as well as other jihadi groups, that that's not sustainable, and it comes back to haunt you. So I'm not quite sure what the thinking is behind it. Well, I'll just add on the prisoner bit. I think clearly there was a sudden crisis with the territorial defeat with a very, very large number of people. And there's been a lot of reporting about the fact there was a much larger number of people in Magoos than they thought. So there clearly just wasn't sufficient preparation. It was an entirely, a wholly different affair just in terms of numbers than you'd had in, in years previous. But I think the other part of this is that, um, in general, one of the things I think we're gonna have to do with the coalition meeting and otherwise is, as I think it was Aaron who had said, um, uh, find ways to, um, uh, repair the relationships with the uh, parties that we're partnering with, whether it's Western countries or parties on the ground. And when it comes to the issue of prisoners, I think that because for two administrations now, uh, to be honest, Obama and Trump, there has been such a focus on operating by, with, and through others, and those others are whoever was there to work with that could get the job done. That's how we ended up working with the Kurds and the SDF. Um, and that, therefore, there wasn't as much thought to all the different pieces that go into this because we're working by, with, and through somebody else, and it's kind of assumed to be their problem. What's happening on the ground is the responsibility of the people on the ground with whom we're working or through whom we're working uh, by, with, and through. Mm -hmm. So separate from the problem that we may not have the opportunity to find such partners in the near future if our reputation takes a hit by suddenly ditching the SDF, Separate from that, I think uh, you make a good point in that we do need to anticipate the need to plan 
uh, for certain things, uh, even if it's going to be the responsibility of the implementation is going to be the responsibility of those on the ground. It's kind of amazing that things like uh, how do you deal with the prisoners and who's going to put food and blankets into these camps is only coming up now. Yes, sir. Right here in the middle. Thank you very much. Jeff Selden with VOA. Uh, two questions. One, military planners are always talking about how Islamic State is very adaptive and resilient. What do you expect ISIS will do differently this time in regards to how it uses its new leadership, how it puts them out there, compared to how it did it with Baghdadi? And secondly, while its supporters obviously want ISIS to do well, are there other players, either in the region or globally, that may be taking actions at this point that are going to help facilitate a resurgence or a rise of another caliphate, or at least keep the group going stronger than the West would like? Who wants to start? <clears throat> um, I, can, um, I can start. I think, I, I think, uh, you can go ahead, Amar. No worries. Okay. Sorry. Um, um, I, I, I think, I mean, I think it was Aaron who touched on it earlier. The, the fact that so many um, kind of pledges of allegiance are coming in, uh, even on Telegram from supporter networks and so on, I think touches on the importance of, of kind of the office of the caliph, right? And I think uh, the idea that um, the individual personality uh, is not exa entirely um, as important as we might think, I think, because all we know about this guy is his kunya and his lineage, and all of a sudden all these pledges of allegiance are coming in. So there's a kind of, uh, from a sociological perspective, there's a kind of uh, importance to the office, which I think almost transcends uh, the individual, what Weber used to call kind of routinization, right? And I think um, it's important. Uh, so so I, my prediction would be that the new caliph would just be just as secretive and just as uh, recluse um, as Baghdadi was. Yeah, I'll uh, second that. I mean, if you look, especially after Zarqawi, who sort of in some ways is of an earlier generation of jihadis and sort of you saw within him sort of the transition between this old school Qaeda way of life and this sort of new ISIS methodology, um, is that you have a guy like Abu Umar al-Baghdadi who for, ye for a few years when he was in power, people in the U.S. government didn't even think he was one person. They thought he was a rotation of a few uh, characters to throw things off for security reasons. In fact, he was one individual, but he didn't even show himself publicly once before you know he was killed in 2010. And then with Baghdadi himself, um, uh, you know, nobody even really knew his background. So it's it's not as much about this whole charismatic leadership idea within ISIS. For them, it's more about the idea of uh, the Islamic State, the idea of the caliphate, the idea of instituting God's law, you know, uh, based off of their interpretations. Um, so I'm unsure that they're necessarily going to do a different methodology, especially since Baghdadi himself lasted a good nine and a half years in power um, without, you know, being killed until just uh, recently. Uh, so I think for them, from a, a security perspective, too, it makes sense to be careful about that as well. I, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, you know, even before Baghdadi's death, supporters, you know, people, I, people would ask, you know, what's next? What happens next? And uh, supporters always said it's not about the leader. It's about the organization and the ideology. Um, obviously, the leader has to have the correct pedigree, um, which, according to them, he does. Uh, but it's not about the person. It's about the, the group. I'll just add, you know, Aaron and I and our, our colleague Kate Bauer in the back there wrote a piece a couple of days ago. And one of the points we argued is that, you know, it seems quite clear that uh, Baghdadi was very involved in kind of strategic decisions. It's not at all clear he was all that involved in the day to day for all these various attacks that Aaron's laying out, terrorist attacks or insurgent attacks. So I think it's quite clear one of the ways they've adapted is by becoming flatter. And there are, there are organizational uh, leaders at lower levels who are actually you know, running things to make sure that stuff happens, and, and that's going to continue to happen, um, whether it's Baghdadi or somebody else. Uh, we had a question right here in the middle, and then we'll go to the back. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm from Inga, from the International Center for the Study of Radicalization in London. Thanks very much for the much for this panel. So I didn't want to ask the first question because I kind of want to move away from Islamic State in Syria. Um, but I think it's a good follow-up to what we just heard. 
Um, I'd be interested on your take if there actually is a proper chance of Islamic State regrouping somewhere else. And could Libya be the right country, the right place for that? Because, you know, we have security vacuums, we have all of that. So um, concretely, my question is, um, is Libya attractive for Islamic State in an ideological perspective? Because, you know, it's not the core territory, you don't have Sunni Shia divides, whatever. And also, is it log logistically feasible to actually get people there or have people um, yeah, proper regroup in Libya? Um. Well, what's actually interesting in, in light of the audio message that came out from Abu Hamza al Qureshi, the new spokesperson of ISIS, he actually mentioned one of the things in, in the speech was that they're now uh, near the shores of Europe unlike before. So for me, that is probably an allusion to Libya because that's probably the closest so-called province there. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, there are rumors that the Islamic State was going to send a bunch of leaders there in the wake of them starting to lose territory in Iraq and Syria in 15, 16, and 17. But um, that didn't really come to pass. Most of the core leadership, obviously, they did some send some leaders to Libya when they were first starting things out there, um, had remained. Uh, but the core leadership did remain in Iraq and Syria. So for me, at least, I, I think that the epicenter of the movement is still going to be in Iraq and Syria just because... That's where it started, and that's where a lot of its base is in many respects. And even though um, uh, the Islamic State was able to control territory in Libya for some time, um, since they lost CERT, um, which was the last territorial, territorial control there in December 2016, which is three years ago now, we haven't seen them really bounce back in the same way we've already even seen ISIS bounce back in both Iraq and Syria. Um, there were some signs that they're trying to regenerate themselves in Libya after their loss of territorial control, but um, it, there hasn't been any momentum to continue, which is interesting considering the various players in Libya um, uh, might have a reason for bringing this back up against each other. Um, uh, but because of that, uh, uh, I'm slightly skeptical at this time until there's uh, – more data to suggest otherwise, especially since the Islamic State in Libya, as far as I can remember off the top of my head, so don't quote me on this, mm -hmm. hasn't actually claimed an attack since around June, I think. So um, they've been quite quiet recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, this year, 2019, sorry. Let's get over here and we'll come back to this one. Hi, uh, thanks very much for the panel. I guess my question is, since I hear a suggestion that the removal of the leadership isn't necessarily have a direct effect on operational effectiveness or tempo or I'm curious if this shift in leadership or this change does it I'm curious if your definition of defeat has changed and what it what it what defeat looks like to to you and I'll invite everyone who wants to contribute yeah. respond um I think defeat is when people are no longer attracted to this ideology. So, I mean, I would argue that Al-Qaeda was never really defeated either. Um, the, and in fact, we ignored the group for so long that they've had a lovely resurgence and are exercising more power and uh, influence than they ever have before, or since it's defeat, quote unquote. Um, but I will say one thing. I'm we're kind of touching on Libya and also the idea of defeat and what's next and uh, leadership decapitation. Is we haven't really touched on what happens if affiliates push back against this next iteration? Um, we saw with ISIS's previous incarnation as al-Qaeda in Iraq, push back against al-Qaeda Central when they were weakened. Um, what we could see is that you know ISIS Central becomes weakened um, and its affiliates might decide to push back. Um, you know, Al-Qaeda Central asked al-Qaeda in Iraq for money, and that was kind of perhaps a straw that broke the camel's back, but will we see the same? Will ISIS Central start asking its affiliates for things, and will its affiliates push back against this um, kind of them trying to keep them in line? Um, and what we could see is local affiliates, maybe in Libya uh, and other places, decide to focus more on local jihad and mo local issues and push back against ISIS Central. And in relation to that, it's also possible that some of them might rejoin al-Qaeda too, um, just because the baya is only a binding legal uh, religious doctrine or idea. It's for a specific leader. It's not to a group. So once Baghdadi was killed, that means the baya is no longer valid, and that's why you then have to redo the bayat from the various 
groups and leaders in the groups as well and supporters so that it's then considered legitimate within their ideological con construct. So that's also something to think about as well. I point out this issue of, of how you define success as something that in government people have been struggling with for a while now. We hosted G General Magada from uh, the National Counterterrorism Center on this panel several months ago when he talked about that in some detail. Uh, the acting director of the National Counterterrorism Center, Russ Travers, gave congressional testimony uh, earlier this week, yesterday, I think, and uh, uh, talked about the fact that we've had success in many ways, but in other ways, absolutely not. You have, you have, you have larger numbers now. You have greater geographic dispersion. The threats are, are different. Maybe a 9-11, I should hope, is less likely, but uh, homegrown violent extremist attacks, while less deadly, are much, much more likely to occur on a more frequent basis. Um, and I would expect that this is a theme that he will touch on next week, uh, the assistant director, when uh, he'll be up on this podium on, on Friday, November 8th, talking about counterterrorism in an era of, of competing priorities. So I think that's a conversation that will continue. You've been very patient in the back. Well, hopefully it was worth it. <laughs> um, a, a question, uh, oh, Scott Edelman, uh, retired State Department officer. Um, it's tangential to this question of charismatic leadership and, and the role that it does or does not play within uh, Daesh. Uh, there's been some controversy, of course, about the uh, manner in which uh, al-Baghdadi's demise was described, you know, the dogs, the, the cringing in fear, that sort of thing. I was wondering if you could comment on what psychological impact that may or may not have had, positive, negative, or any at all, uh, both within the movement and on potential recruits. Amar, you've been so quiet. Let's throw this one to you. <laughs> Sorry. <yeah. laughs> um, no, I think I think if there was actually some kind of audio, it might have had um, some impact on supporters and and and, and so on. But um, coming out of strictly the mouth of uh, our beloved president um, or your beloved president, um, <laughs> I don't I don't uh, I don't I don't think uh, it'll have any real impact. And I mean, judging by some of the chatter on telegram at the very least in terms of what the uh, what the fanboys have been saying um, it had almost no impact if anything it just made them more irritated um, so uh, it, you know if, if there was audio if there was some kind of video of, of, of um, things like that I think it would have had more impact and I remember hearing on uh, on uh, I think it was the French television network that um, this idea that of, of Baghdadi as a coward um, almost doesn't make sense because you know he was brave enough to kind of blow himself up and kill take his family with him right and um, it, it, and, and and so the I don't know I, I don't think it has the has the same impact as uh, as we'd hope yeah I might define bravery differently myself but I hear I hear the point you're making <laughs> Um, I'd like to follow up on, on something that we just mentioned a moment ago, Aaron. You were talking about the buyout and how people could shift. And um, I'd like to ask the three of you what you think about the potential uh, now that Baghdadi is gone for there to be some type of um, reunion among all or parts of the Salafi Jihadi landscape some or all of the al-Qaeda affiliated movements. The, what's the significance of the fact that he was hiding in an area that is thought to be more of a Hursaldin al-Qaeda type place, that he was paying people affiliated with Hursaldin, maybe not the group itself, maybe just paying individuals, but being able to do that, groups that had been literally fighting tooth and nail. Does this mean anything? Is there a prospect for some type of uh, um, re-merging uh, of, of the groups? I'm personally skeptical. Um, I, I don't think uh, that Zawahri wants to be seen as um, pledging Baya to the head of the Islamic State. And in the same way, um, ISIS will not do anything for the benefit of Al-Qaeda because they're seen as a group, whereas they are a caliphate. So why should they submit to Al-Qaeda's wishes to reconcile? Um, it's possible things could change if, say, Zawahri might be dead. Um, but again, I think both groups have diverted a bunch over time. That would be pretty hard. I still think in some cases on a small tactical level, you see some type of arrangements, whether we've seen it in areas like the Sahel region and Mali and Niger. In Yemen. Uh, in Yemen, um, or even possible 
individual in Hura Sedin or maybe somebody that was in ISIS that infiltrated Hura Sedin and therefore used it as a cover. We obviously don't know enough details about that story. Um, uh, but on a grand strategic level, I'm still a bit skeptical. I'd concur with that. I think, you know, what happens very much on the tactical ground to ground within the same village, town, could be some sort of cooperation. But ideologically, the groups just differ so significantly. And there's also been so many actions by the Islamic State against Muslims that have gone against what the al-Qaeda believes should be done. You know, the, the groups differ. They, they agree in the same end goal, but they really differ on how they're going to get there. And al-Qaeda, you know, believes that Muslims and non-Muslims alike should, you know, be brought over to our side and, and won over slowly. Um, and, you know, the scorched earth policy by the Islamic State has made it so that many people will just never come to that side. And the ideological schism is just too big. Amar, what's the view on the terrorist frenemies up in Canada? <laughs> no, I think uh, I, I agree with much of that. And I think um, going back to Inga's question about uh, kind of affiliates and so on, uh, we might see interesting um, shifting dynamics in other parts of the world, right? We, we just have to kind of wait and see um, the way they've restructured their provinces, for, for example, the way they've teased apart their Khorasan province into different, um, uh, different arms and the way they've kind of consolidated their uh, many different provinces in Syria and Iraq into two um, shows uh, at least kind of suggests that um, focus is going to be on elsewhere, at least during this transition period. And during that focus, we might see kind of shifting allegiances with different groups. Um, but I mean, it, it, it's kind of too early to say who kind of renews their via and who doesn't. But uh, it, it's something to watch for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to remind everybody that um, the, Aaron's new study, Waliyat al Hal, is available uh, both online and we also have a handful of, of hard copies here if you would like. Please join me in thanking all three of our distinguished panelists for a really fabulous discussion, Aaron, Devorah, and Amar. Uh, Amar, especially for making it possible to do this via VTC. Please join me in thanking them today. And thank you all for taking the time uh, to join us, those of you who joined us in person and those of, us, those of you who are watching via live stream or in the video that's going to be on the website for posterity. Thank you for taking the time. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.